Greetings and welcome back to another discussion of Perspectives. I am fortunate today to be joined by Mr. S. He is a an Austrian, uh, an Austrian of uh, many and wise years, who will hopefully uh, inform us about some of these critical questions, because up until now, I've basically been speaking to Germans, and every, every time I talk about German-related cultural matters and what have you, it's all about Germany, and uh, I know a fair bit about Germany as I've lived here for years. I did live in Austria years and years ago, um, in the Steiermark, but that is a long time ago. So, thank you for joining me. Uh, Hello, welcome. Thanks for having me. The first question that I just have to ask is, as an Austrian, particularly as an Austrian, what do you perceive to be the differences between Austrians and Germans? Well, it's of course always a tricky when you enter this uh, field of uh, stereotypes, but uh, I think everything starts when you look at the geography of Austria. We border to the east, uh, to, um, towards Hungary, that's uh, incredibly uh, flat, and the country is uh, easy to be entered. Um, we had uh, the Romans uh, way more present and earlier present than the Germans. Um, Canuntum and other larger cities, uh, Windubona, Vienna. Um, so it was also not that we embraced uh, the Romans when they entered our uh, our lands, but our geography in the east uh, made it much easier for them uh, to conquer the land. And after the Ro Romans, it was the Avan and the Hungarians and the Turks. So we were always very much exposed uh, to be uh, conquered uh, and to be uh, culturally enriched. Um, and I think that made us uh, a little bit more exposed to the influences of other tribes. Uh, there's also this saying that uh, the Balkan uh, starts in the third district of Vienna, uh, which is then true for the Austrian and Hungarian Empire. Um, so it was probably impossible for Austria to stay uh, strict on uh, many things uh, since we were always having a lot of uh, foreign influences. A little bit as with the Dutch, uh, with the access to the sea, and in Austria it was the access to the east and to the Balkan. Uh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people often uh, cite the, the Battle of Vienna as a sort of historical legacy and something that is sort of imprinted uh, upon the the Austrian people. So you think, I guess you're suggesting that <clears throat> that long history of foreign interventions and I guess you could call it cultural cross-mixing has uh, endowed the Austrian people with uh, a greater sense of uh, awareness towards external influences, maybe? Also, also. I mean, there was this uh, very good interview with the mayor of a Hungarian uh, town uh, done by Brittany Pettibone. And he was also saying that in Hungary, there is uh, so much uh, culture just around uh, not being um, uh, ruled by the Turks anymore. And uh, many of the traditions are just uh, to celebrate that fact. Uh, it's definitely not to that extreme in Austria. But I remember my grandmother still talking about uh, the family history and the Turks uh, trying to, um, to conquer our village, uh, which they finally did. And so this was uh, 200 years or 300 years before her time, and it was uh, still part of the um, family history. What what area of Austria do you originally come from? I originated 40 kilometers east of Vienna, towards the Hungarian border. Okay, okay. And of course, <clears throat> as is convention in in most countries, the, the biggest city, the people who live there are usually, well, my experience having talked to Austrians is that people who live outside of Vienna typically don't like the Viennese very much. So if you're from, say, the Steiermark or Linz or whatever, you probably, uh, this is what I, I've heard, you probably don't have the best attitude towards uh, Viennese. H how is that in, in Austria, would you say? Yeah, well, there's certainly a lot of uh, truth in it. Uh, I think the further west you go in Austria, the less the people like the people from Vienna, so Tirol and Vorarlberg, they feel quite uh, detached and they hate it that the capital and uh, all the decisions are made uh, in a completely different environment. And 
Um, but it's of course also a love hate relationship because if you have, if you have, uh, ambitions in Austria, if you want to have a serious uh, career, then there is no way to go around Vienna in most occupations. So, so uh, everything important is happening in uh, Vienna, all the larger um, universities and, uh, conferences and uh, companies and uh, jobs. Uh, so uh, in, in almost regardless of, in, of your professional your interest, uh, you have to spend some time in uh, Vienna and uh, um, this is your, your access uh, to, to the world. Um, and of course, things have uh, also changed in the past. In the 60s and the 70s, uh, there was probably a different attitude than it is uh, now. Uh, in my case, it's also a love-hate relationship. I, I started to go to school in Vienna when I was uh, 14. And, of course, in, at that age, it was the coolest thing for me to get out of my small uh, village and to uh, have the opportunity of a bigger city with all the amenities, uh, with uh, McDonald's, with uh, cinemas, with uh, shops, uh, with, uh, with the amusement parks and everything. So at that age, it was, of course, uh, very, very cool for me to, to uh, live in Vienna. Yeah, yeah, but uh, it's interesting you mentioned Feuerberg. That that's, I mean, I've always regarded that it's it's almost Switzerland. The dialect they True. speak, it's 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 it just seems to be a kind of historical coincidence that it's even part of Austria. But yeah, you know, I've met I've met Absolutely. people from there, and yeah, yeah, they they don't they don't sound really like Viennese. They just sound like Swiss, Swiss Schweizer, yeah. yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I have relatives uh, in uh, from Vorarlberg, and I have uh, one of my ex-girlfriends is also from Vorarlberg, so I have had quite an exposure to people from Vorarlberg. And but you see, that's also so typical for that part of the world. The, the borders are so blurred, and it's a little bit uh, arbitrary because better. One part of Austria is now within Austria, or within Bavaria. When you look at the history of Salzburg, when you look at the history of uh, Tirol, the, the existing borders, as they are right uh, now, uh, this, is not, this is not carved in the stone. No? This is uh, just a momentarily uh, situation. And I think we just form a cultural uh, re region with a lot of interlap. And it's, uh, it's in, in the case of Alberg, uh, really it wouldn't make a big difference if they would be part of uh, Switzerland. Probably for them it wouldn't uh, feel too much different. Yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, uh, obviously Bavarians would prefer to be, well, you know, Freistadt Bayern, but, you know, I, I, I think Bavarians would prefer to be part of Austria than the rest of Germany. Yeah, I'm not so sure. I, I have a lot of business contacts with Bavarians, and uh, um, I think they would, maybe they would like to take over bits and pieces of Austria, but they wouldn't want to be part of Austria. I so. I think they could uh, easily live with uh, taking over Tirol and uh, Upper Austria and uh, Salzburg. That would be okay with them if it would be a greater Bavaria. But I think that they would not want to be part of Austria. That's not to it's it's an I don't think so. No. Well, what about Austrian attitudes towards Germans? Because this is obviously years ago. Um, I mean, I, I don't. Do you still use the term Piefke and Piefke Niesisch? Yeah. To yeah, it's a, it's a still uh, it's still uh, used a lot. Uh, um, it's I think not much has to change. It's also a love hate relationship. It's the it's the larger brother. Uh, many Austrians tend to think badly about the Germans also because of the Second World War and they think they brought uh, that. Uh, uh, all, all that uh, crisis, all that uh, bad things uh, over us, and uh, so ne never again we are friendly to the Germans. Uh, that's um, the attitude of some of the older people. Um, with the younger people, it's uh, it, it's a little bit different. But there, there is the problem that at Austrian universities, Austrian universities are full with German students uh, because of the numerous clauses in uh, Germany. Mm. So wh whoever is not making the cut in German is coming to study in Austria and uh, in some some subjects it's one third of the students and so of course they increase the competition to take away the, the places for some of the Austrian students so, so some of them see are, are a little bit hostile because of this uh, at the other end uh, they integrate uh, nicely and they, uh, they, they, there's nothing uh, too bad to be said about the German uh, students in Austria, except for the fact uh, that uh, maybe the German government uh, should uh, pay a little bit for their tuition uh, to the Austrian state. Um, 
Yeah, I should just briefly explain, explain NC uh, numerous causes. So in, in German universities, there's a sort of, in the Ameri American terms of GPA, the sort of the grades that you've received and and certain universities won't accept you if you don't reach a certain rank or level in that. Um, and that varies also within German Bundesstaat and within the different states of Germany. Uh, as far as I can remember, the, the best universities or the, the highest standards in Germany are in the, s the southern uh, states, um, Bavaria. And Saxony, Saxony, funnily enough. Um. Okay, okay. But, you know, because I knew people with, with bad NCs and then they ended up going to places like Hamburg or whatever. But, um, yeah, so that's a, a little thing that they have in in Germany. Now, what I find really interesting, um, and I wouldn't say mysterious, but speaking of World War II and the events of World War II, the fact that Germany has a very, very different reception and perception of these events compared to Austria, and specifically, I guess, more of a literary tradition, you know, some like Gute Gras, Vergangenheitsbewältigung, which Maybe in literary Austrian circles is a big thing, but I, I guess I, I I don't get I don't get the same impression from Austrians that it's World War II is such a big deal. Uh, it, it's not a or almost as if Vergangenheitsbewältigung um, is not really a huge concept in Austria compared to Germany because even if you're not a literary person in Germany, there. It's everywhere. Have you ever heard of these things called Stolpersteine? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. But we also have them. We also have them in, in Salzburg, in uh, Graz. In, uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. And uh, I think you're right. I think it's uh, more to the extreme in uh, Germany. Um, it's also, again, a little bit because of the, of the history and that we got our treaty in uh, 1955 and uh, we were officially neutral afterwards and uh, all the troops are left Austria, so we, we, we are not an occupied country anymore. We don't have American or Russian or troops in our territory now for quite a while. Um, so that's, that's already a bigger difference uh, to, to Germany from my understanding. And uh, it's way more to the extreme in uh, Germany. But it's the, the undertones are the same in Austria. There is also in the news, and now with the new government that uh, is to be formed between the People's Party and the Freedom Party, at all the left-wing uh, media, and there is almost only left-wing media in Austria, there is articles almost every day where they also compare the People's Party, uh, the Freedom Party, with uh, with, the, with the Nazis, and uh, so it's it's also a constant topic. But as everything, it's not so extreme and not so and not as strict as in Germany. It's uh, um, the, the fundamentals are the same, but it's executed a little bit uh, more sloppy. Well, why do you think Germans have? dealt with this and, and, and deal with it in well, in a more extreme way compared to Austrians. Is it because of the history that you cited, you think? The I think um, well yeah. And Germany is, of course, much more, la much larger and much more important. No? So it's, I think, for the for the Western powers or for the Americans, uh, it's way more important to keep uh, Germany under and uh, make sure that there is uh, no real proud and independent uh, Germany, because that would be a real competitor in almost each and every field. Uh, so. Germany is way more important. Austria is only one tenth of uh, Germany, and whatever happens in Austria has no significance on the on, on the larger scale. Uh, I think that's the main that's probably the main reason that there's simply more focus and more pressure on Germany. So, do you think that without external influence, uh, the way Germany had dealt with the events of World War Two would have been very different? <laughs> I think, of course, because that's the addition oil that you put on the fire. But then again, this is the differences between the Austrians and the Germans. The Germans want to be want to be the best in everything. 
and uh, they also want to be the best on the on the guild uh, le- uh, on the guild uh, level, and they, they 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 are more strict also to themselves uh, and, uh, and and to deal with the issues like this. While the Austrians are better in forgetting, and uh, we have the saying. Uh, Manchmal muss man auch äh, die, äh, etwas gerade und ungerade sein äh, lassen. Also, okay. wir, wir, also, of course, it, it, uh, all things come together, but I think without the external influences and if the media would not play on this, uh, wouldn't play this uh, song again and again, uh, then it would normalize over time there as well, because uh, why shouldn't it normalize? No? It's uh, 70 years, 80 years uh, past, uh, at some stage, uh, you need to stop uh, be feeling guilty for your his- for your history. It has it has uh, nothing or very little to do with the uh, with the people that are still are living in the country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I've had a theory about this <clears throat> uh, Christian original sin abs into this sort of uh, a sort of cult- cultural uh, religious influence where you sort of uh, yeah you. you well, you basically inherit the sins of the fathers. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty convinced of this because, uh, well, in other places of the world, say Japan, which doesn't have the Christian influence, I mean, they're on kind of the other extreme end. They, there's a lot of revisionism. They, they claim that nothing happened at all in some cases, but they don't have this uh, this attitude of, of absent of, of, of sort of religion, mm-hmm. and, and we have to. Uh, make atonement and blah blah blah. It's, it's so I'm, I'm I think that's part of it as well. Uh, I, I, I I'm inclined to think at least. Um, of course, but then also Japan is an island, no? so for them it's easier to go their own way since they have no direct borders uh, to nobody. And uh, in the case of Germany, especially with the relationship to France uh, and uh, to Poland uh, and uh, to the UK and uh, the Benelux uh, and all of these uh, nations so close by. I think it was also, a, for a certain period of time, it was a necessity to say sorry uh, to the neighbors and uh, to, to be a little bit, uh, to make yourself a little bit uh, smaller after what has happened uh, before. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think there is an end to everything. No? Maybe it, it, it all started with real good intention and uh, to make uh, amends uh, with, uh, with the past and with the sins of the fathers. And it, 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 I, I'm not completely against it. No? I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, saying that uh, Germany was without uh, guilt in the in the history of the Second World War. But I also don't think that it is as it is portrayed in the official media uh, or in the official well, narrative it, of it, history. It never is. I, it uh, never. I I have a friend who. Uh, recently finished an American <clears throat> university class on modern German history. And uh, it, it was basically propaganda. It's, yeah, extreme left-wing, well, typical left-wing. The, the causal factors involved in World War II, things like, uh, you know, Weimar Republic, inflation, Treaty of Versailles, all these things, and it just doesn't get mentioned. And he basically, at the end of the the class, thought it was just a waste of time because he didn't really learn anything. He didn't learn about, you know, Bismarck. It it was all this sort of, I guess, an American version of of German uh, guilt. Mm. uh, I mean, I guess the point is that there's more to modern Germany than just World War II. Uh, Absolutely. But... That's all the class was about that in Katzitz. But um, you know, and uh, this kind of tunnel vision uh, regarding World War, particularly in the United States, where where I grew up, where he, yeah, that that's all that's really talked about. And I see that because I'm older than he is, that nothing has really changed. Um, no, yeah, it's it's unfortunate. Um, but it's not only that nothing has uh, changed, it's even getting more extreme. Uh, I have the feeling that 20, 30 years ago, when you in, in school at university in, uh, and on the television, uh, um, there was a, there was way more focus also on other periods of our history. And now it's almost exclusively about this uh, um, certain 12, about these uh, 12 years. Um, which is really, it's, which is really strange for an area of the world which is so full of history and uh, which, which is so full of other interesting uh, stuff, and uh, uh, it's, it, it cannot be a coincidence that it is like this. Um. 
Yeah, yeah, but I, I see this across the board, though, this, I guess you could call it left, I don't really know, I guess it is left interpretation. I mean, I was, I was, I was in a conversation with the same friend, and my background academically, among other things, I had a lot of interest in medieval history. And then, so I, I was just looking, I was just looking at some things, and so when Charlemagne was in power, um, many, well, over a thousand years ago, <clears throat> he had this incident, uh, sometimes referred to as the Massacre of uh, Ver- Verden, where he killed mm-hmm. a lot of pagan Saxons and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> the, the title of this article was, you know, Was Charlemagne a Mass Murderer? And I just thought, well, <laughs> I mean, I, maybe, but why, why frame the language that way? It just seems that even in the medieval period now, they're, they have these kind of modern sensibilities about things, which I, I guess is understandable. But, um, yeah, I, I don't... Uh, it's basically making making Germany uh, and the whole region out to be only one thing, and I mean the course he's explained it was supposed to be from you know the early nineteenth century up to the present, but <laughs> it was I think eighty percent about World War Two uh, and twenty percent about you know modern Germany and the AfD and. <laughs> <laughs> And he just felt like he he had wasted his time taking it. You know, uh, it's I, I I don't I don't understand why they can't just present all the information at least in, in equal measure and then just say, oh, well, is it, that's the only way you're going to understand things, rather than just narrowly focus on uh, a certain period of history. I mean, it's understandable, but and it seems in this regard the Austrians are better at, at dealing with it. But you've said that. The media in Austria is very left wing and very, I guess, biased towards that. Uh, yeah, and universities as well. Um, really? Yeah. Uh, and also for the uh, identitarian uh, movement or for people uh, which uh, which the dissenting opinions, uh, it's uh, it's a little bit the same as in uh, Germany. As soon as uh, you are doxed, as soon as uh, people know about your identity. Then you run into real uh, big uh, problems, and uh, there is a real uh, hunt uh, after the people from uh, these uh, movements, or for also for, for, for the people or about the people from the Freedom Party. And uh, it's um, yeah, it's also not uh, in, the, in the real life, uh, the, re- the everyday life is also not uh, good in this regard. Um, well, how how would you say the average Austrian? Average educated Austrian, at least. I'll put that in Anführungsstrichen. Average in air quotes. Average Austrian, uh, educated Austrian, re- views uh, the identitarian movement in Austria. First of all, I think the average Austrian doesn't know about uh, them. Um, it's still uh, it's still a minority program only for people who are really interested into these uh, topics and uh, the average educated Austrian probably doesn't know about uh, the identitarian uh, movement uh, and uh, most of the mainstream people who, who know about uh, them would consider them as extremely right-wing uh, Nazis, uh, which is absolutely not uh, true, but they wouldn't even listen to a video or to an argument. Uh, they have... Uh, uh, preformed opinions uh, which are the easiest and the most uh, convenient uh, for them and uh, they, for, they, they, they are not open for discussions um, hmm. well, they would not revisit their stereotypes uh, never what, what are the uh, positions of the Austrian identitarian movement would you say yeah, I think the main position is the ethnopluralism, um, which um, which means uh, that uh, it's uh, the, the French should uh, remain uh, French and the Belgian Belgian, and the Greek uh, Greek. Uh, so that there is uh, still some variety and some flavor and some differences between the countries and the, the, the nations, um, and uh, that your identity as a, as a person is is layered. No? You are not only Austrian; uh, you you also from Vienna from the eastern part, and uh, then you are European also on a on a wider on, on a wider level. 
So I, I think it's very very smart. They have quite a, a um, they have good, quite a good uh, philosophy, and uh, that's definitely a, a big uh, difference to many other movements. That the intellectual foundation of the Interian uh, movement is really really good. Um, of course, the, the, the left is then also calling this is just the same old uh, garbage uh, with new nicer words and their terms. Uh, but I think that's not uh, that's not okay. That's not uh, fair. Um, and I would like to see more intellectual uh, debate between uh, proponents of the identitarian movement and others, socialists or uh, um, leftists. Uh, but they are not up. They are they're not open for these discussions. No? They, 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 they have the fear that they might lose the argument, so they rather don't want to have the discussion at all. I saw one interview on Austrian television on YouTube. Uh, I don't know who the other people were, but uh, Martin Lichmetz that mm -hmm. I tried to get on. Uh, it was pretty short, so I didn't. There wasn't much to say, I guess. But uh, there definitely was on the one side of the argument the attempt to uh, paint him uh, as a very negative person or representing uh, very negative views. I mean that makes sense that the mainstream media uh, would do that. But it is interesting, you know, I, I when I listen to identitarians that nobody that I know involved in it is, you know, calling for you know, Lebensraum or something like that. Uh, it's more a question of maintenance, I think, of, of what has existed histor historically, at least post-World War II. Absolutely. Yeah. But I... <sighs> That, what I also find interesting, European identitarian movements contrasted with American ones, is that in the United States it's mostly about white identity. And I think, well, I've said this before, I don't think that really works very well, as you pointed out. You know, there's an Austrian identity, there's a Zutirola identity. You know, I think Europeans are much more fixated on the specifics of their own identity. Yes, um, you know, we're mostly white, but it's. Yeah, it's it's more than just that in Europe than in the United States, where you really have this sort of mishmash of cultures that have been baked into one thing, sort of. And, mm. uh, uh, I, I I don't think I'm I'm not a, I'm just not a I'm kind of I guess I'm too much of an atomized individual, but it, I'm definitely feel more sympathy towards European identitarian movements than I do sort of a kind of very bland well white identity that doesn't really. I don't find any resonance with that. Uh, yeah, same here. Same here. Uh, I full, I'm fully with you on uh, on uh, this. Um, um, of course, America is a different kind of uh, playing uh, field, and um, uh, their things are, are, are different. Uh, they they don't have this long-lasting uh, history. They don't have these uh, variations in uh, nations and uh, people. Um, they have this race issue way more way more in the in the front uh, than than it is here in uh, in uh, Europe. Um, but of course, it's also, maybe even some people would think like this, but it's a very unsexy topic uh, to come up with. No? This is uh, really, the, that would be wind on the on the opposition and on, on the left is if uh, people would start arguing uh, like this. And in reality, of course, in some areas of Europe, in Belgium, or in some districts of uh, Vienna, you meanwhile have uh, so many uh, Turks and uh, Muslims uh, that even the, <laughs> I don't know whether these uh, Muslims are, uh, it's not a razor, but it's also there. There are also the differences become uh, so 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 large uh, that, that that's more our issues. I think uh, with this immigration of uh, Islam um, and uh, Muslim uh, people, um, that's the underlying uh, current. Uh, while in America, it seems to be this uh, black, uh, white, uh, Latino thing, which is the underlying current. Um. Yeah, and the question I've always had with regards to um, the. Uh the Muslim problem or the Islam problem in Europe is I have yet to see anyone uh, offering an argument for a tangible benefit to having Islam in Europe. I haven't seen a single argument. It's more sure. like, well, we're kind of, they're there, or they're here, and you just kind of deal with it. No one, it's not like, I, I, I sure you have opinions about this, it's not like, well, the Euro has these benefits and it has these disadvantages, it's just, they're here. Nobody can, no, nobody can offer an argument why uh, Islam in Europe is a is a good thing, um, but I do think, unfortunately, I, if I'm a realist uh, and I tend to be, it's in a lot of countries it's too late. 
Um, the Muslim presence is so strong in France, for example, I think is on, well, it, it would it be civil war? I don't know. It, there, France is probably the worst. The Netherlands is, is getting in there. Belgium, you, you mentioned. Parts of Germany. Uh, I'd imagine Vienna maybe you probably have some mosques there. Um, yeah. And then you contrast that with a place like Hungary, where effectively um, the mosques there are either historical monuments or museums. <laughs> they don't yeah. have. Uh, I and and then you can't even point out the hypocrisy that uh, you know if you wanted to set up churches. Um, and mind you, I'm not a huge fan of Judeo-Christian monotheism. But regardless, if you wanted to set set up churches in Saudi Arabia or Iran, you probably would have some problems. Yeah, probably not a good idea. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I don't really, see, I, I mean, I, I'm a bit black pilled about this. I just everywhere I look, because I live in a in a pretty big city uh, in Germany, there, well, there are Muslims everywhere, and they have their own communities, and uh, they don't really interact with uh, the non-Muslims if they don't have to. Maybe in in a business situation, a restaurant, maybe, um, but. Yeah, I just think that's going to get worse and worse. In fact, I can cite a story. I might have mentioned this on my channel before. There was a, a Dutch couple that went on a holiday, I believe, um, in the Czech Republic, and they thought it was really, really nice. And then they suddenly had a kind of longing, Zinzucht, to go back home. And they arrived back home, <laughs> and nobody was speaking Dutch, and <laughs> everyone, everyone was cover, covered up in towels, and, and all of a sudden they wanted to go back to the Czech Republic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, within within a few hours, um, but yeah, and I, I'm at the same friend that I mentioned, who's in his twenties, because I'm I'm older, and you know he'll he'll never be able to experience Western Europe as it had been even in the nineties, because I remember Western Europe in the nineties, and it was still pretty much Europe. Uh, sure, there were certain things, but it wasn't like this, uh, where you have to go to a small village, maybe in in France or in Germany, some village in Upper Bavaria, to get some sense of authentic, the authentic native culture. It's absolutely uh, true. German cities are really rough. No? German oh. cities are a real cultural shock for me. I have, I have a lot of business trips to Germany, and wherever I go, I'm shocked. Bonn, Heidelberg, uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It has changed so much in the last few years. So. Well, Berlin, too. I mean, uh, it, I used to, years ago, I lived in Berlin, and but this Berlin, I wouldn't expect anything different anymore. No, it's the capital, and uh, it has always had this uh, this uh, certain uh, vibe. But I'm more shocked that even these uh, mid-sized uh, towns are also changing so much, and I feel so so alien when I'm uh, there. I feel so not belonging. Uh, that, that that's really shocking. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'd agree. Um, I've a couple of months ago, I was in Mannheim, which is not that big a place, not small by any means, but yeah, it's it's all very different. Uh, <clears throat> Munich, too, not really, I mean, of course, just like in, I remember that there's a kind of, there's a historical hostility between people in Munich and Bavarians that live outside of the city, that's not uh, unexpected, obviously, but Munich is just, uh, yeah, it's very multi I guess you could say. Uh, and one of the problems is what you mentioned before, that it's, there's no mingling between the ethnies. Huh? The, the, the Turks, uh, the Arabs, uh, the Muslims, they really stay within uh, their own uh, Oh, yeah. Not even the Turks mingle with the, with the Arabs. They, even uh -huh. they're separate from each other. Yeah, uh, and uh, and 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 this is this is this is real hard coded, no? This is this is unbridgeable. I used to live in a house with uh, people from all over the world, and uh, uh, I, I knew some of these uh, families for ten, fifteen years, and I'm really a friendly and open uh, person. Uh, and it was impossible to break these uh, borders uh, down, and even to make them uh, greet you in the morning. Uh, impossible. Yeah, in my neighborhood, you basically have. I guess most of them are Germans, so the Germans, the white Germans, Turks and Arabs, and the only time you have interaction as a, a, a I guess as a European, I don't know not German, but whatever, I mean, Europeans, is when you, maybe you go to a Turkish restaurant, maybe an Arab restaurant, whatever, but otherwise they just, <clears throat> they just do their own thing, and in American English we have this expression, stay in your own lane, it's a driving yeah. expression, you stick, you stick in the, to one area of the, of the, the road. And that's basically the way it is. And 
people tolerate each other, I, I think that's the best case scenario. But um, but that's it. it. There's not a lot of free exchange between people. They they don't mingle. Um, <clears throat> you can see this in the bio laden, you know, because there's so mm-hmm. many of them now. Uh, it's very rare to see people other than Europeans in the bio. By the way, that's like an organic supermarket. Uh, I won't comment on the merits of that, but yeah, you won't see many people uh, outside of Europeans there. And yeah, I guess people just have come to accept it. Uh, I think as long as people's daily life and their personal interests are not disturbed, then they tolerate it. And I, I've said before that it would it would really take for anyone to become very concerned about uh, the immigration issue. Their fundamentals in their lives would have to be affected and threatened. I think because as yeah. long as you have you know a roof over your head and food and you have your job and you can go to the cinema and, and whatever. Uh, I, I don't think people are going to be very concerned uh, because they, their livelihood isn't threatened, basically. Not not yet, at least. True, true. I think in the end, um, I, I rather think about our weakness and not about the strengths uh, of uh, the Turks and of the Arabs, of the Muslims, because uh, they just take over territory which is uh, which is free, which is free to be uh, taken. And uh, what is really shocking me is uh, that we have uh, lost our sense for unity and that uh, we fight for our uh, way of uh, life and uh, morals and this was definitely different in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, 90s. Uh, maybe it was unpleasant for unconventional uh, persons like me. I always felt a little bit uh, trapped in Austria because everything was so strict. Uh, but it has a very good uh, feature on, on the society because it kept the uh, things uh, together and uh, and kept the, the level. And this is completely history now. Nobody is, is daring to speak up and uh, to do uh, things and so therefore the newcomers uh, do whatever they want because nobody dares uh, to correct them. Um. Well, I have a theory about this. Uh, I, 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 I call it in German Geschichtliche Lebensmüdigkeit and I don't know if it's true but basically centuries and centuries of warfare and killing each other like, Europeans at some point in time got just tired of of, of um, of of being alphamipus uh, and and just trying yeah. to and just wanting to I'll fight for everything. Like, well, okay, we fought we fought for five, <laughs> for, for for a thousand years. Uh, we need to rest, basically. And of course, the result of this, if if the theory is true, I, I, that's my impression, at least on the continent, that people are just it's kind of like a, a cross generational lebensmüdigkeit, or at least. Maybe it's not Lebensmüdigkeit. They're just tired of fighting. Um, yeah, Kampfsmüdigkeit. I don't know. But yeah. at, that at some point in time, they <clears throat> they just yeah, they just they just like okay, whatever, just leave us alone. We we don't want to fight anymore. But so many things were tried. I mean, you had you know the you could call it sort of continental imperialism of the 20th century. Well, actually, 19th if you well, more than yeah, 19th in the 20th century. Before that, you had uh, the wars of religion. Um, the, uh, it just goes so far back, and maybe yeah, they're just uh, Europeans became tired of it at all. But uh, I think you know a little bit of vigilance, you know, Vaksimkeit would be useful. Although I think it's too late. Like I said, there are some countries that are so far gone, like France and Belgium, that you know, for, forget about it because. Really, if one's honest, at this stage, there really is only an option of violence. I hate to say it, because how else are you going to convince people? I mean, there are theories, you know, you could get pay people to leave, um, but I doubt they would want to, um, and you'd have to pay them a lot of money uh, to, to justify it, I, I think. And, and, I mean, even this is just this is just theory. This is just fantasy. No mainstream government would ever consider things like this. Yeah, most likely not. Um, but then the identitarian movement uh, is uh, trying to bring in a new term, remigration, remigration. Since now it became a little bit easier to dis- 
discuss this elephant in the room and to talk about it. Uh, so they're trying uh, to shift the overtone uh, window even more in another direction. And uh, the current uh, main uh, team theme is about remigration. Um, of course, the mechanics of such an undertaking are very, very complex and complicated. And I'm not, also not sure whether this is a real possibility. But, I mean, you have to think about all the options that are viable. Right? If, if you, if we cannot simply give up in uh, thinking about how to improve uh, the situation. Uh, the, 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 that would be horrible. No? That would be really giving in, and I'm, I'm not willing uh, to give in uh, completely. Well, I think, <clears throat> I think there, there, are other, there are other things that could be done. Uh, for example, I, particularly online, I've encountered a lot of... Um, uh, people who who live in certain countries, you know, Denmark, Germany, but they're Turkish, right? And so they don't really identify either as Danish or German or anything like that. And, um, you know, what could be done, for example, is maybe take polls uh, to see how people perceive themselves. Because one, th- one point I've, I've tried to bring up in <clears throat> to people who advocate the sort of multiculturalism uh, or even the civic nationalist type is that you know for a person to embrace uh, so let's say American values whatever the, I don't really know what that means let me be more specific German values or Austrian values because I think that's a very ambiguous American values I don't know I really don't know what that means anymore something <laughs> more identifiable <clears throat> they also have to consciously consciously and simultaneously. Uh, rejects where they came from. Now, I'm not saying that's impossible. It is. It is. Some, a few people can can assimilate and say, I don't like this culture I came from. I like this culture more. Okay. But I think in, in the majority of cases, it'll be very difficult. Um, and in my experience, uh, talking to some of these people, um, you know, they they don't really identify either as Turkish or Danish. They're sort of just lost souls in, the, in this particular case that really I can remember quite vividly so uh, that's one way of you could do polls just to see how people perceive themselves um, and you could then bring forth arguments about the fact that people, they don't consider themselves uh, German or Austrian or Danish or, or Dutch or whatever um, but but these are even the most uh, complicated cases then, huh? because in the, in what to do with the people who are really stuck completely in between, uh, these ones you have to integrate in the end. No? The, you cannot send them somewhere else. I think it's very easy with the, with the extremes, uh, with, uh, with the people who are really, especially with, this, uh, with the Turks in uh, Germany, who are so, so still so connected uh, to their home and uh, uh, who, oh, if there's yes. a... If there's a soccer game in uh, Germany against Turkey, and uh, even if they're born in uh, Germany, they will always uh, stick with the Turkish uh, team. Uh, and uh, I think in these cases, there is at least a chance they still have a connection to their heritage and to their roots, and there's a chance uh, to, to maybe uh, send them back uh, to Turkey eventually. Um, but it's the ones who are really in between and lost in this cultural universal uh, universal lessons, uh, with them it's really the most complicated and because uh, they are of course not a threat, they are not an enemy, but they are watering down the existing uh, identity and I'm very much afraid that these people who have no identity whatsoever will become the majority. Um. Well, in the case of, yeah, in the Turks in Germany, <clears throat> in my experience, are pretty obnoxious. You know, you, you, on a weekend, you'll hear honking and hooping, and it's always some, I don't know why they, uh, I've mentioned this before, I suppose it's petty of me, but it's just loud, they're, they're honking their horns, it's a wedding usually, and all these cars, and it's just very loud, and uh, it doesn't appeal to me, it doesn't appeal to Germans, but you know, they do it anyway, they have no regard for the environment, they're not polite. As they don't care. They, they don't care, yeah. They kind of... It's little turkey, pretty much. Um, yeah, uh, but... And I think some of these guys would... Well... No, I think what they would argue is that they want to live in Germany, but they want to be Turkish. <laughs> you know, they, 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 no, I think very few Turks living in Germany actually want to live in Turkey, particularly Western, uh, sorry, Eastern uh, Turkey, mm-hmm. a, lot of, uh, a lot of the Turks originally came from. So I don't, I don't, I don't really see that, <laughs> because they like the benefits uh, they have here. Um, 
and but it's only yeah. the it's only the material side, no? It's, it's always then only about the material uh, benefits and uh, the soft factors, the culture, and uh, maybe they the like it that it's uh, clean and that the garbage is uh, collected and electricity on all the time. Um, but it's also more material uh, than uh, than emotional. Uh, and that, that oh, no, they, they have no interest in, I don't know, like the Deutsche Aufklärung or anything like that. They don't care. They probably don't even know when that happened. Yeah. Um, I, I'd say as a rule, most Germans don't know either. I mean, this is, I've seen this across the board in, in multiple countries, but, for example, even the ability of people to write coherent sentences, the, 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 the Rechtschreibung is just it's terrible. Uh, same thing in the United States and France and UK, but it's, there's a general uh, degradation of, of educational standards. People don't really care. I think this is all connected, ultimately. Um, Very much. Uh, in Vienna, in most uh, classes, I have uh, a colleague uh, and uh, two daughters are in gymnasium, and she's from Croatia. And in the classes of her daughters, there are only two or three native Austrians. And her Croatian girls who came to Austria only two or three years ago are the best in German. They are better than some of the Austrian students in the class, in a gymnasium. Uh, it's uh, it's absolutely shocking, and of course, this is uh, also watering uh, down uh, the, the standards. Um. Well, yeah, and I, I think absolutely. I think that I've seen this across the, the the board in European countries, the United States. A lot of this has to do with internet and the technology, because um, what happened, of course, with the internet. And you and I are both old enough to remember <clears throat> a time uh, prior to the internet is that. There used to be certain, I could call them linguistic standards that were maintained through radio, media, and television, and the internet gave everyone freedom to express themselves. And so there, there's, there isn't really a standard anymore that people can uh, adhere to as much. Uh, I think um, it's it's it used to be in Germany specifically that you know you'd get uh, people who were undereducated who couldn't speak uh, Hochdeutsch. Okay, mm -hmm. now it's just. Yeah, they sort of speak Hochdeutsch, but they can't write sentences correctly. Uh, their vocabulary is very small. Um, uh, it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty shocking. Um, but yeah, this happens. It's happening in the UK. It's happening in France. It's it's happening just across the board. And I think it's all interconnected. A lack of of standards. A lack of desire to maintain certain educational standards. A lack of interest in in the history. You know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, creates this really watered down. Yeah, it's just a kind of. You, you're absolutely right, but it makes me wonder. I'm, I'm also a father, and it makes me wonder how other parents. How can you not teach your children? How can you not uh, make your children uh, enthusiastic about uh, science, history, geography, and whatsoever? How can you not? Try to induce uh, this uh, fire in your children uh, to be uh, smart and intellectual, and uh, to make them even smarter than than than, than you are yourself. And uh, and it really makes me wonder how, how how this is possible. This this watering down because it all comes back to a lack of uh, interest uh, of uh, the the adults. Um. <laughs> Yeah, if, I, I, if, the, if the schools are fucking up, that's one thing. But uh, how comes that the people are not doing their job? Um, yeah, I mean, my father um, was born in Hungary and then emigrated to the United States. <clears throat> and yeah, he was an architect before he retired. And, of course, he, whenever he, we would travel to Europe frequently um, and visit things like the Sistine Chapel and uh, Notre Dame. And, yeah, he always imparted to me that, that enthusiasm, even though I didn't go on to become an architect. He certainly made me aware of architectural history, the different periods, and, and things like that in general, uh, the, the 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 men of the time, the Da Vinci's, the Michelangelo's. Um, I don't know. Uh, I used to think that <clears throat> this sort of disinterest in, in history and science, and just sort of the the story of 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 human beings in, in recent times, what we call history, is a very American thing because America is very yeah, it's just disconnected to things, but increasingly over the past two decades I've noticed that Europeans don't they don't really know anything about their history either. I would, yeah. I would, I would guess that your typical 
Austrian Viennese person couldn't tell you the first thing about the, the Habsburger, for example. Uh, mm, but yes, of course, the older generation didn't knew everything. They were so well educated and they knew so much. But of course, now with the with the last two two or three generation, it's uh, it's not the same anymore. No. How much of this do you think? I, I sometimes call this a McDonald's effect, but <clears throat> how much do you think this is sort of American commercial influence, where the highest? Because you're in, you're obviously involved in finances. There's a real debate you can have between, quote-unquote, economic productivity or uh, economic efficiency versus the maintenance of, of cultural goods. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could, I think you could argue, uh, you could argue that, okay, sure, you could might get a higher GDP if I mean, you do X, but um, oh, more and more I'm thinking that, that economic productivity uh is probably not the, the sole good that we need to uh, maintain. Uh, yeah, because if it I were, think you're right. if it were, uh, we wouldn't have all the problems in Europe that we're having right now. Um, so, how much do you think a lot of this is sort of American influence, even passive American influence, with commercialization and you know McDonald's on every corner and uh, yeah? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I think you. I think you're right. Um, I think you're right. Because no? when you have to be constantly successful, you have to make more and more compromises, no? On your moral, on your ethics, on the time you spend uh, for with your children, uh, um, and the pressure is getting uh, more and more every every year. No? The, the targets are getting higher. The the, the the budget deficits are getting higher. The national debt is are getting higher. The pressure is uh, mounting uh, everywhere. And uh, at the same time, everybody is having larger houses, larger cars, um, uh, and, and so much more need to consume in order to feel alive. Um, it's, uh, it's, I think it's, uh, it's connected. In the past, the people made had made, had a good life with way less uh, money and uh, they amused themselves by reading a book and talking about it uh, and uh, now it has to be the cruise ship in the Caribbean um. yeah and I think that's uh, has a largely a cultural origin in the United States um, because in the United States that's all you really have is consumption um, and striving for the next uh, bigger thing I mean, yes, there are some cultural aspects but uh, to things, but um, that is the highest good in the United States and has been for, I, I think, quite some time. Uh, mm -hmm. Just consumption and yeah, <laughs> making lots of money and uh, 10,000 varieties of coffee you can get at, some, at Starbucks or whatever. Um, yeah, it's just... And the funny thing is, it, it doesn't make you happy. I'm a coffee aficionado. I really, really love a coffee. But even with this wide variety, it doesn't make me as happy as going to a very simple uh, coffee house in Italy or an uh, autobahn station highway rest station uh, in uh, in Italy. Coffee is always uh, always uh, better there, and uh, they only have uh, one kind of uh, coffee there, and it's always good. It's always uh, nice. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's. Uh, and uh, I think you're you're right. Of course, the, the engine behind this uh, development is the, is America, uh, the United is the United States, uh, and it's a worldwide phenomenon. I also spend a lot of time in Asia, and I can see the same changes in society also in Asia, in uh, Thailand, in uh, Vietnam, in Indonesia. It's the same everywhere. Yeah, I, uh, years ago I lived and worked in South Korea, and I still <clears throat> try to keep in touch with some people I know that stayed there and. Uh, about ten years ago, I left there, and, and it's, it's in those ten years things have changed completely. But uh, yeah, I mean, you could <clears throat> obviously there's something about human nature that uh, finds consumerism at some level appealing. Otherwise, it wouldn't be everywhere. But I think it well, it does leave people uh, really empty. Absolutely. I, I, it's a risk-averse uh, culture. No? I think it has all to do with the uh, fear and risk. Um, and uh, this consumerism is uh, making you feel uh, safe. 
you don't you you don't have to have undergo any risks uh, and uh, if you have everything available all the time then there's no risk of uh, of nothing uh, no risk of failure um and that's for me on the psychological level the underlying uh, also with the discussions people are so afraid to speak up because they could say something wrong and uh, they, somebody could prove them wrong or so and there's this a fear of doing something wrong of of not winning of not being on the safe side well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you see this with uh, this really, really <clears throat> malicious uh, sort of internet culture. There, there's some event in Canada recently, I don't remember her name, but some graduate student that was told that she was uh, some kind of micro... I don't understand this stuff because I think it's silly. But And so her, her fellow graduate students at this program pretended to be friendly to her in, in real life, but then on the internet uh, were sort of upvoting comments that were negative towards her, and it's, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt the internet is, has been a, a transformative force that has brought both good and bad with it, I think, because I mean, the fact that we can have this conversation, that's the internet, but it's also brought a lot of uh, bad with it. And... Uh, yeah, well, people just aren't interested in learning things. If you're interested in learning things, then your your highest priority isn't really getting things right or always being right. It's to understand things and learn and acquire new information. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know it's, if it's because I, I spend a lot of time in academia, but I, I just can't have interesting conversations with quote-unquote normal people anymore. All they care about are their iPhones and their petty relationships and maybe they'll complain about work but uh, you know if I want to um, talk about the Holy Roman Empire I'm, I'm basically having a monologue <laughs> so, <laughs> I, 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 admittedly that's not a popular topic or historical topic for a lot of people but it's um, yeah it's 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 yeah it's very it's very isolating um, True. I, I grew, grew up in a household although I did grow up in the United States that was very much steeped in yeah, European traditions and both the good and the bad, and and just a kind of awareness of the history and all this stuff. And I, I I left the United States. Part of the reason, not the only reason, but I thought, well, you know, Americans aren't interested in this stuff, but Europeans would be interested in this stuff. <laughs> They're not interested in either. Not yeah, not anymore, or not not as many anymore. Of course, it's uh, still there's still these uh, pockets of uh, good uh, people, but they are getting harder and harder to find. And uh, I'm running into similar issues uh, as uh, you mentioned. It's uh, getting harder and harder to find the people for interesting uh, conversations. Uh, luckily, there are still uh, some around, uh, but uh, not so many. Um. Now, one issue that we haven't touched upon that would be interesting, and I think it's related to this, is <clears throat> the EU. Now. I think the the migrant crisis has helped kind of muddy the wa waters in discussing the integrity and the validity of the EU as a kind of super union or governmental body um, because people are, are much more concerned with the immediate consequences, you know, the trucks of peace and, and things like that. Um, that, I, I mean, sure, there's still EU skepticism, but... The EU itself, as a as a topic of discussion, uh, I, I'd say prior to the the migrant crisis of 2015 was much more prominent. What, I don't know what your view on that. What do you think? I, I think yes, it's it's a little bit out of the open discourse uh, right now, but. I think the EU, they are really losing on the approval rating of the people. Um, so this migrant crisis is not such a, so it make, makes it so obvious that the EU has no solutions for the important problems. Always only talk and, uh, and only talk about a solution that should come up, but then no execution and no good uh, planning and no nothing. Uh, Individual countries are uh, reduced in their ability to come up with their own uh, local uh, legislation to fight things. And whenever they do something, then uh, the uh, Brussels is uh, threatening uh, them uh, to cut subsidies or to sue them at the court in uh, in, uh, in Strasbourg or wherever. And uh, it makes it very obvious that the emperor is wearing uh, no clothes. Uh, and uh, that's one of the good things for me that uh, now 
even average and normal people have no more trust in this European Union and they see it uh, quite empty. Um, the average Austrian, of course, would be even afraid to talk about leaving the EU. She's like, the, we would uh, cut our empirical uh, cord and uh, then we wouldn't uh, be able to survive anymore. But I think that's, uh, that's uh, bullshit. Um, and if things carry on uh, like uh, this, uh, then the European Union really needs to be scared about the opinion of the people and uh, that there might be referendums and uh, votes that uh, more countries uh, could leave the European and that there won't only be the Brexit, uh, but that other countries could follow. But here's the paradox. The same, as I'm sure you're aware of this, the same Central European countries like Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, that have taken a, a pretty hard stance on immigration and said that they don't want Islam there, they, they let's be honest, they like the EU subsidies, particularly these countries. They don't want to leave the economic advantages of the EU. Yes and no. Yes and no, because I, I'm, I'm working in a bank who is exclusively dealing in Eastern Europe, so I have a lot of Eastern European uh, colleagues and I spend a lot of time there. And I think, of course, they take these uh, gifts, but if hard comes to hard, then they forget about the money. They say, fuck the money. We rather stay, we rather keep our families happy and stay as we are. Um, so uh, it was a very nice change for them after the collapse of the, of the communism that the joint European Union and that the subsidies were flowing in. But they are, for them, they're still used to even live with less than they have now. For them, it's not such a threat as for the Westerners. Uh, and uh, I think it will be very, very hard uh, to bribe them in the long run because there is a tipping point, and the tipping point is quite uh, low. Um, and uh, they, they, I think they will keep a very hard stance on this no immigration policy, and there is no threatening and no bribing that could change their mind. Yeah, but I mean, even with Brexit, I haven't followed up in, in recent months, but it seems to be taking forever, and nobody can agree on how they want to proceed. Uh, I don't know, are, are referendums really effective? And we look at uh, the, the referendums of the early 2000s, where uh, countries like the Netherlands and Ireland, they said they didn't want to be part of the European Constitution. Yeah. Just, they just ignored it. They just repeated it. <laughs> it's, True, true. And the Brexit is a very strange uh, thing for me as so well. I follow it uh, as good as I can, and uh, it's uh, it's, uh, it's taking uh, ages. And uh, <laughs> I'm I'm afraid that it might not uh, happen in the end. And uh, I'm also afraid that they will make it as uh, intransparent and as complicated uh, as possible in order not to set uh, the scene for other countries uh, to follow, make it easy for other countries to follow. Um, yeah, and you're right, of course, referendums uh, but, uh, are, are quite uh, inefficient and uh, then uh, they change a little bit here and a little bit there in order to appease the people, And then, in, but the majority of things is still coming uh, through. But in the end, the, uh, this, the most important thing is the opinion of the people. It's this overtone window and it's uh, the perception of the, the people and uh, it's getting... Even it's getting more and more complicated for the ruling elite in uh, Brussels to steer the opinion of the people in their favor. Um, therefore, they also are quite quiet, uh, relatively quiet these days. No? There's not much coming out of uh, Brussels. Uh, they know that uh, right now there is no time for any big messages uh, whatsoever. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, do you think there's a possible, I mean, in the next decade or two, a real possibility for peaceful reform of all of these things, even the peaceful retirement of the EU? How um, realistic do you think that is? I think uh, every peaceful solution seems way more realistic than any solution with violence these days. So the armies are so small, the people have no uh, no guns. Um, so uh, as you mentioned before, there is this uh, campus müdigkeit. Uh, so uh, I, it's very hard for me to imagine to see any violence, um, uh, maybe small clashes, but something large, almost impossible to comprehend. Uh, so uh, almost by definition, it has to be a, a peaceful I think. Um, I think it has a lot to do with the money. No? If there's uh, still enough uh, money around uh, to to pay for everything and uh, to, 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 to keep the machine uh, going, then it's difficult. But if we run out of the money, if the budget deficit is becoming too extreme, if the euro is, uh, is under, coming under real pressure, if the money is running out, uh, then things could go very fast. 
I mean, as you're involved in finance, I, I probably should ask you some questions on that topic. But it just seems that <clears throat> modern means of called money production, printing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you, pro- you probably remember the early 2000s where everyone was <laughs> saying, well, there's going to be hyperinflation in the next five years. Mm-hmm. And they said 10 years. And then it became 15. And it just kept on going and going and going. Uh, I, I think the, these guys have learned how to avoid that somehow. But, I mean, the closest I think, and I'm not hardly an expert to what some kind of hyperinflation scenario is just sort of the, the great recession um, that that hit us in 2008, 2009. It's still ongoing, obviously, but do you do you foresee uh, any uh, financial crisis of the proportions that we'd seen in the past, like in Weimar Germany, or do you th- still think that's, that kind of thing is possible? Mm-hmm. I would think so. I would think so, because... <laughs> And basically, after 2008, nothing much has uh, changed. It's kind of uh, everything is just keeps on uh, going as uh, before, more or less. Some small changes here, some small uh, changes there. Hardly any large bank was uh, really falling over, hardly any bankruptcies. Uh, um, so uh, it, for me, it's more likely that we will see a crisis that, uh, the, that we won't see a crisis because everything is so artificial. I must admit, I don't understand any of this anymore. Well, whatever I learned, at, whatever I learned at the university cannot be applied anymore. I, most fundamental uh, theories have been proven wrong in reality, and uh, there's so much artificial influence uh, and so much uh, trickery behind uh, the scenes uh, that I must admit that I don't understand it anymore. And this is not a good sign because most of the people in finance that I know also don't understand it anymore. Uh, and so how how can this carry on uh, much longer if the people in charge don't really understand what's happening? Yeah, and I think economic theories need to be either overhauled or people need to catch up. Because I, I had my stage when I was younger where I became obsessed with, say, Austrian economics. And mm-hmm. yeah, I think many of us did have that stage or that phase but it just seems that many of the predictions aren't accurate anymore because they they follow a model that uh, a model of money production that doesn't really exist anymore um i mean i i don't understand it either and i'm not involved in finance i just find it very mysterious um somehow it kind of works um but but that's very scary if you're saying that people involved in the financial sector don't understand what's going on yeah uh would you say that's very common in your colleagues to just they're kind of lost as far as how this works of course for for the everyday job uh, this kind of uh, no of knowledge is not really needed no? whatever you are specialized in uh, you you need to do your job uh, so this overall understanding is not needed for the daily uh, for the daily uh, job uh, and maybe there is one or the other genius within us, uh, within our group of uh, people who really knows what's happening. But I don't think so. I talk, this is one of my favorite topics. Uh, I, 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 I approach a lot of uh, people uh, and I have the feeling nobody is having a, a real uh, clue. And uh, it's a little bit like a religion. You, you look up to the altar and uh, the sun is uh, shining through the windows and everything <laughs> looks uh, great. Um, yeah, well, I, I think one of the big differences is the transition from physically printing money to just basically working with computers exclusively, where, well, it doesn't appear to be actual printing anymore. It, it's sort of it's manipulating numbers on a screen, I, I, from my understanding, mm-hmm. which, you know, how, how are you supposed to understand a system like that? Because it's not like uh, the <coughs> e, ECB... Um, or the Federal Reserve is saying, well, in fact, they make it a, a, a point not to disclose how they uh, how they proceed and, and their inner workings. They say, well, you know, public can't know this, so they, they're trying to obscure this and, and make it even more difficult to uh, to understand. And, and people are just sort of. Uh, left to guess, I, I suppose. It's, it's alchemy, you know. It's uh, it's uh. Well, yeah, yeah, but uh, I think you, the way you put it is like religion. Like, well, I guess the money's still coming somehow. Uh, it's sort of still working. People can still consume. I, I guess it's okay. It's it's really sad because you know, thinking late 2017 that 
uh, we'd have a greater understanding of the things. But uh, yeah, we've at least on the economic front, it, we've kind of re- reverted back to primitive religion here. Yeah. Uh, and very alarming that someone involved in finance, such as yourself, um, also very you know respect to you for acknowledging that you know not even you understand what's going on to a large degree. Because I, I'm a I'm a layperson in finance, and I I don't have a fucking clue. I really don't. Yeah, yeah even, but it also has to be said that most people in the banking are not very smart. <laughs> that's uh, that's um, that's almost a, a precondition uh, to to make it into the the job. Uh, I think the, the the smarter ones go and join the consulting agencies or the or or or, 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 or go. Any other road. Uh, my boss, uh, who is a very, very smart person, uh, he, he studied theoretical physics. Uh, he's constantly saying uh, that uh, he thinks that the more that the real smart people are not in banking. He, he's constantly disappointed about the intellectual level around uh, him. Um, and I agree. I think uh, he's a writer there. And um, this is this also makes it possible that this kind of religion alchemy thing is uh, happening uh, because the people in the industry are not very critical and they don't want to admit on average that they don't understand. Um. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I guess it depends on the level uh, of finance you're working at. But if you're just working at a bank as a kind of angestellte, you probably shouldn't have high expectations of the person. No, but uh, funny enough, these are the smart ones, uh, the people working the branches, the youngsters uh, who have to deal with all these rules and regulations these days. I have the highest respect for what that they are doing because uh, they really they, they do a good uh, job, and it's so difficult that uh, these days with the anti money money laundering uh, directives, with the terrorism financing here and uh, this and uh, all the different uh, products and all the unhappy people in the bank branches. Um, so they are really they, they are quite. Of course, they don't need to understand how the money system is uh, working. And the people in the head offices, uh, they also, they, they, it's silos. No? One silo is uh, working on mortgages. The other silo is working on uh, credit cards. The next uh, silo is working on uh, and so on. And um, <coughs> on the top management, the people, there, it's more about uh, networking and having the connections. And, uh, and so I also, I also think that they don't care too much about these issues. They just think, if things will carry on, it's much better for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think this is probably a reflection of the, the general, I mean, execute selfishness. Is everyone is sort of in it for themselves these themselves these days, and yeah, there's no well, there's no sense of community. Uh, I mean. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've been for for months now, or maybe a year, maybe even longer. I, I just, you know, I feel very connected to sort of European culture in general. Although everything's been so diluted, I can't say specifically what I used to feel connected, even though I'm not German, to mm-hmm. German culture because I'd studied it for years and the literature and the history, but it doesn't really exist anymore. So, I'd, so now it's just a language that I speak, and. Uh, yeah, and, and the United States, I think, is the worst offender here. I think the United States, the things that have been going on there for decades, has created uh, an atmosphere where you feel a connection to nothing. I grew up in New York City, which is probably the, wor- the worst offender. I mean, it's just a huge place with everyone looking away from each other because, you know, you enter a subway and nobody really wants to make eye contact because maybe they'll, they'll attack you if you do. Mm-hmm. And, uh, if you have lots of money, I guess you can enjoy the consumerism. But, yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely, I don't want to use the term victim, but I'm a, certainly a casualty in, in this kind of cultureless environment that we've created over the previous decades. And it, um, and it's very hard to get out of this. No? We almost have to relearn uh, how to be normal and how to how to be traditional and uh, how to have a culture. And uh, it's uh, it's very difficult. Uh, it's part of the things that the identitarian uh, movement is uh, trying uh, to bring about. Uh, that it is uh, also about to redesign who we are and rediscover who we are and uh, uh, in, in, in a modern day and age uh, because I don't want to just stupidly, stupidly follow 
old things. Uh, some, some things maybe have to be adapted uh, to to the year 2017, uh, but yeah. we all have to start to do an effort in order to get out of uh, this. Uh, uh, and, and maybe we don't succeed, but I very much would rather like to give it a try than uh, to give in. Um. Yeah, well, I, over the next couple of years, I'm going to leave Germany. I mentioned this a million times, but I, I do want to, I guess, spend the remaining years of my life, if possible, in Hungary. I don't want to go back to the United States. There's nothing there for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think Germany, and unfortunately Austria, because like I said at the beginning, this is 99. I spent about nine or ten months in, in Graz. And uh, it was an interesting time. Uh, but, <clears throat> yeah, I remember a time in Austria when uh, the biggest concern, at least in the Steiermark, uh, was, you know, Slovakians <laughs> <laughs> causing problems. <laughs> you know, this seems to be, le- at this stage, if you could choose between, you know, mass immigration from Slovakia versus uh, North Africa, I think the vast majority of people would choose the Slovakians. No, absolutely. Uh, so it's think the times have changed uh, quite quite a bit. And uh, I don't know, but yeah, I, I, I obviously things need to be adopted to to the, the current year. I hate that expression, but you know what else can we say? 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, it, it's I don't know when I when I speak to you, I get the impression that you're realistic and yet you're not at the same time. It's kind of resignation. Um, you know the the the. It's it's f- sort of fighting the fight because it must be fought, but there there is a an insight there that maybe it might be too late. Would you say that that's accurate? Absolutely, but I'm I'm the father of a five year old uh, son, and so I'm I cannot be only realistic anymore. No, I, I, it's not only about uh, me. I'm also doing uh, this uh, whatever I try to do. I'm also doing it uh, for him, and uh, you cannot raise uh, a child uh, without uh, being uh, positive and without uh, having a positive vision of the future. That's that. I that's completely th- agree with you, but I also see a challenge here, specifically <clears throat> regarding your son. And here's the thing: we everyone knows that there comes a point in a child's life where <clears throat> the parental influence becomes more minimal and the peer influence the people that the the child becomes greater now we all know what the peer influence is like these days uh i'm sure this is a concern you have but i mean because you obviously you can't isolate him and keep him in the house away from his peers um but at the same time i mean do you have any i as he gets older do you have any ideas of how you'll be able to at least make him aware of some of the things going on in the world and and the things he'll be exposed to. My, my plan is to make him as uh, smart and as uh, normal as possible. Um, he is quite uh, sporty. He likes to play with uh, Lego. He can already read and uh, write. Uh, he's uh, he, he he's a real uh, smart little uh, guy, and I just would like to to help him to develop his uh, talents. And then, of course, it's up to him how he can thrive in that environment or or, or not. No? I cannot protect him. I don't want to overprotect him. I'm rather trying to expose him to the outside world. I don't want to put him in a private school or anything. I would like to put him in a normal uh, public uh, school so that he has real exposure to the roughness um, uh, that is around him. And if he is, uh, if, if he manages to flourish in that environment that would be the best if it's too tough for him if it's too rough for him if this is not working out uh, then i would take him out of this uh, school put him in private school or homeschool him even if it's if it's not working out if it's too much for him that's that's my approach but i don't want to overprotect him i would like to make him as uh, strong as possible yeah just <clears throat> obviously it's a very difficult task or a big challenge when Almost the entirety of the environment is uh, is geared against that. Um, when, <laughs> yeah, when you don't have proper uh, proper proper schools anymore that even teach basic history, and uh, uh, people but, don't even learn how to read and read and write properly anymore. Uh, it's, it's, but I must admit, you know, I also have no I have no hope that uh, he will learn much in school. 
and so my 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 expectation level is very low. I think that's the job of my of my wife and of the grandparents and of us. And uh, we are all academics. We are all uh, we all like to 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 read. Uh, so we we can whatever the the whenever there is a gap in what he's learning, then I'm willing to fill in and to make sure that uh, his education is rounded up uh, nicely. Um, so I'm not willing to to. Uh, outsource uh, that uh, part uh, at all. Uh, I'd rather see this school uh, as a social meeting uh, place uh, for him uh, to, to learn about uh, people and their uh, life. And uh, when it's about the intellectual side of things, then if this is not, if they don't do a good job, then I will do it uh, or we will do it. Uh. Well, that sounds like a good good plan. Um, but uh, it's always, you know, having children in the current, the uh, atmosphere just uh yeah I, I, as a, if i were a parent i'd be um yeah I'd, I'd probably be pretty worried about that but it seems that you're very sort of calm and, yeah. and relaxed about it made it. me more funny enough uh, becoming a father got me out of my uh, idleness no? before i was also observing things i was not happy about the things but i was very inactive and uh, i didn't have the the motivation to to do something uh, and funnily enough uh, since the pregnancy test uh, was uh, positive my life has uh, changed and um, and it's good <laughs> I'm, I, of course uh, with children you always have a worries uh, but it's better to have something to worry about than uh, not having uh, a, a reason to to go through well, life uh, yeah yeah although one could worry about the child called Europe too but <laughs> <laughs> probably beyond uh beyond the scope of of people's abilities to really at least individuals abilities to uh influence them mm. i'm uh i'm aware of your time since you're a very busy man and you have to uh fly about the globe uh is there anything else you'd like to uh talk about or or mention um and maybe I have a, I have a last uh, story to tell you. Uh, since you told your told your story about the Dutch couple in Czech Republic, um, this uh, this summer uh, I returned to my home village uh, where I grew up, where I spent my youth, and I went to the public uh, swimming pool. And um, it's a mid-sized town, ten thousand inhabitants, uh, socialist, large uh, factory, and in, at the swimming pool. 50% of the kids uh, were Turkish and 50% of the kids uh, were Austrian. Uh, and uh, the Turkish uh, kids, all very loud, very sporty, playing with each other, being very active, no adults around, all of them alone. And the Austrian kids, uh, all rather small, fatty, not active, not sporty, and none of them alone. All of them protected by their parents or grandparents, and there was no interaction. It was like a class wall between these two groups. Uh, even though that they go to school and to kindergarten together, there is there is no way to for them to avoid themselves uh, in, in in their in their life. But at the pool, when it was the free choice of uh, of uh, the two groups, uh, whether they mingle or not, there was no interaction whatsoever. It was really scary. <laughs> Well, there's actually a, there's some theories that people have proposed regarding this. It's more in the United States that I've heard this, but I'm sure it could apply to Europe too. That the, uh, the previous generations of parenting uh, have um, changed the way that parents interact with children, so they're much less likely to to um, you know the the line of lesson, let the leash go, and just well, do. Whatever, you know, have fun in the park, whatever, we'll check up on you in three hours. Because they're always concerned something might happen. And they're all, there's this term in English, the helicopter, yeah. for example, is always just hovering, flying around. And, and um, something happened between our generation and then the next one. And the, these people, the, the millennials and the, even the younger generation, the people, their parents had a very different approach to how we were raised and just just to sort of develop a sense of independence and curiosity and, and what have you. And, yeah, so I think that, that almost too much supervision, uh, too being over, overly protective, um, and I think, yeah, pe people think that that's one of the major causes, at least in the United States, for 
some of this in saying like safe spaces, mm-hmm. safe spaces for words, and you can't have a discussion because someone might be quote unquote harmed if <laughs> if they hear an opinion they don't like, and and it, this this insanity which isn't quite as bad in Europe yet. This crazy stuff though, that we hear from Canada and the United States with students who 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 calling for safe spaces can't even talk about topics because they're so afraid. Mm-hmm. Uh, it that has to come from the home and this this attitude towards raising children and not giving them a sense of uh, independence and just uh, just kind of doing your own thing. I mean, for for many summers, I was sent off to a sleepaway camp for two months and just you know I was left to fend for myself and basically mm-hmm. just. Yeah, you know, I you know, got into fights, unfortunately, and yeah, you, know, you just kind of learn how the world works. Um, you know, you learn about hierarchies and all these things, and yeah, if you're always with your parents and they never leave you, you, you can't do that. True. Um, and then you know you get this phenomenon of of the the adult child too, and so it's I don't know how you break that because basically we're talking about two generations going forward who've been raised under these circumstances. Um, and I think the, the example or the story that you provided is a good illustration, obviously, because the Turkish kids are just sort of doing their own thing and the Austrians are just kind of passively sitting there. And almost um, more, more close and more related to the Turkish kids, because they reminded me more of my youth and uh, how we were at the same uh, swimming pool 40 years ago, which was a really strange uh, feeling I had at that moment. <laughs> Well, because I think that's just a human universal that it's normal. It's more. It's more of a normal thing for children to develop independently and kind of discover their way in the world and discover their interests and 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 whatever, uh, rather than basically having you know uh, parents with you twenty twenty four seven. You know this kind of ubavaksamkeit that mm. it's artificial, um, and yeah, I, there are all kinds of theories how that came about. You know, people say it's related to the, the '60s and the sexual revolution. I don't really know, but it's definitely had an effect on on the generations I see. Um, not only are they inarticulate and uneducated, they're they're terrified of reality and and learning anything about the world. And what are they going to do when they when when they're put in the positions of power? I, I have no idea, or or at the very least, have to work in an environment where they have to face challenges and, and pressure. I, I I just don't know. They will be easily be ruled. So I think with that kind of personalities, uh, it's very easy to to rule them and to make them do things. So. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, um, although yeah. I, I don't know. It's it's, it's hard to be optimistic uh, about going forward. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, but uh, well, thank you for providing information on on Austria. It's nice to uh, get well a, a different sense of uh, ger- well, both sort of German, uh, Germ- Germanic, a diff- different sense of uh, side of uh, of things. Uh, I've I've been living in Germany way too long. I should come visit Austria sometime. I guess. Uh, yes, please come back. I'm living next to Graz. I'm also in Vienna. So whenever you're around, I invite you for a beer. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I tend not to drink beer, but yeah, I, 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 it is, Vienna is still, from what I understand, aesthetically a very nice city. Um, I've heard it's been years since I've been there. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's very nice, but it's also becoming a little bit of a Disneyland. No? You have all these uh, sites, and uh, you have so much tourism and. Uh, um, so for, for for me as somebody who has been living uh, for a long time in Vienna, I avoid the hot spots like uh, Schloss Schönbrunn or First District because uh, it's so full, it's so packed uh, with uh, tourists that I feels like a Disneyland and not like a real town anymore. I see. Well, fair enough. That's uh, definitely understandable. I thank the audience for uh, tuning in. Uh, if I still can get um, Mr. Lichtmetz on, I, I would like to. Um, he seems to be very... Uh, yeah, I don't know how to describe him. Like literati, something like that. <laughs> he's, he's, he, he, he seems... But uh, hopefully, maybe you can convince him. Uh, I, did, I did actually manage to make contact with him, but uh, I asked him and he kind of just... Uh, 
Äh, ist im Äther versunken, quasi. Äh, but everyone, thanks for tuning in. Äh, My pleasure. Und vielen herzlichen Dank. Ja. Dankeschön. Schönen Tag noch. Um. If you like this video, please like, share and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.